الذين آمنوا إذا نودي للصلاة من يوم الجمعة فاسعوا إلى ذكر الله وذروا البيع ذلكم خير لكم إن كنتم تعلمون إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فهو المهتد ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدًا عبده ورسوله صلى الله وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين يقول عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا All praise is due to Allah We thank him, we seek his forgiveness and to him alone do we all repent we ask Allah Azza wa to forgive us for the evil within ourselves and the shortcoming of our deeds. Whomsoever he wills to guide, there will be no one to misguide that person. Whomsoever he wills to misguide, there will be no one to guide that person back to the straight path of Allah Azza wa Jal. And I bear witness that there is no divinity or sovereignty or king or God or Lord worthy of worship except for him, Allah Azza wa Jal, and that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam truly is his final prophet and messenger. May all the peace and blessings be upon him, his family members and companions, and to all those who followed him in his way until the end of time. Ameen. Amma ba'd. In this time, and specifically in this time where Muslims and Islam are being attacked verbally, physically, from everywhere. It's important for us to understand how it is that we are supposed to react to these, you know, whether they're hateful speeches or whether they're physical abuse or whatever it is. It's important for us as Muslims now more than ever to understand what Islam tells us, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, what the Prophet ﷺ tells us about how we should truly react when these things attack us or these people attack us. And I want to start out with a very beautiful story that happened to the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ was given the, the wahi, the revelation, and he became a prophet at the age of 40. And for a few years, he's trying to round Muslims up, and he's trying to gather them and teach them about this religion. And he's trying to call, he's trying to call his society to Islam, something that is better than what they were doing at those times, getting rid of the evils and the oppression and the justice at that time. So the Prophet ﷺ started as one person and his group became a few. Then you can count them with all your fingers and then you needed more fingers to count. And now subhanAllah the Meccans are understanding that they're not just a group anymore but they're a small community. They're growing. They're becoming one strong entity. And something needs to be done about this. So you can imagine how the leaders of Mecca would gather together near the square where the Mecca is, and they would talk. And then we'd see the Prophet ﷺ standing and sitting by the Kaaba. And these are the leaders, the noblemen of Mecca, discussing amongst one another, saying, This man has completely destroyed our society. We have to do something about this. Ya Utbah, O Utbah. Ibn Rabi'ah, his name was Abu Walid as well, that was his nickname. Oh Abu Walid, اذهبوا تفعم هذا الرجل. إن كان يريد مالا, إن كان يريد ملكا, اذهبوا تفعم هذا الرجل. Go and speak to this man. See what he wants, see what he needs. Let's come to a conclusion and have him let go and give, give this thing up. Because it's completely dismantled our society. So they're watching as Utbah, Abu Walid, agrees, gets up, and heads towards the Prophet ﷺ. And when he reaches the Prophet ﷺ, he says, Ya Muhammad ﷺ, you are a very noble man from a noble tribe and a noble lineage. You're known as a Siddiq. You're known as the trustworthy, a Sadiq al Amin. You're known with all of these great characteristics. This is you. And ماذا تريد من كل هذا? What do you need from all of this? What is your end game? What's your goal behind all of this? 
You know, you've, you've, you know, فَرَّقْتَ بَيْنَنَا وَشَتَّتَ شَمْلَنَا You've created so much destruction and you've created flaws in our society. صَارَ الْوَلَدْ يَدْخُلْ فِي الْإِسْلَامِ وَأَبُوهُمْ لَا يَدْخُلْ فَلَا يُسَاكِنَا That the, 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 the kid would enter Islam and the father would not enter Islam so he wouldn't let the kid live in the house. He would disown him, abandon him basically. والزوج يدخل في الإسلام ومرأته لا تدخل فيطلقها. And a, a, a husband would enter Islam and his wife would not enter Islam and he would divorce her. والعكس, the opposite is true as well. المرأة تدخل في الإسلام وزوجها لا يدخل فتطالبه بالزواج بالطلاق. That he, this man, and the, that she enters Islam and he does not enter Islam so she asks him to divorce um, herself from him. You know, subhanAllah, like, it completely dismantled the society. And he's saying, you, you cut even families. What do you really need from all of this? I will give you four points, four proposals. Take one of them. Whichever one you like, you choose. If you came with this religion, if you came with this religion that you have come with because you want money, you want wealth, you want to become rich, then from today, we will, we will gather so much money for you until you become the richest amongst us in Mecca. You know, don't, don't waste your time. We will make your path easy. You don't have to sit there and call people years after years and your numbers will get bigger and bigger and then when they're rich enough, they'll give back to you. No, no, no. We will pay you today and we will make you the richest today. Muafiq? Leave all of this behind. You know, we'll give you and make you the richest. Just leave this deen of yours behind, this religion of yours behind. You know, don't curse our, um, our idols and our gods. Believe in our gods as well. And stop saying that Allah is the greatest. You know, just, just believe in us. We will make you the richest today. Muafiq, are you in agreement? Do you agree, Muhammad? He said, La. No. No. You will become the richest. No. So he said, okay, I'll, I'll go to the second point. He probably doesn't want money. He probably wants something else. If you came with this message, with this deen of yours, because you want power, authority, a kingdom, you want to become a king over everybody, then from today we will make you the king of Mecca. Wallahi, we will not do anything without your permission. We will not write an agreement or break an ag agreement without your permission. We will not go to war and we will not leave from war without your permission. Nothing in Mecca will be done except with your final say. Do you agree? Just leave your religion, O Muhammad. He said, no. He's starting to become a little bit more agitated. Why is this guy not wanting this? If anyone else was offered this, they would take it with a blink of an eye. So he said, number three, if you want honor, you want us to include you in our poems, and that every poem will start with your name, and, and so on and so forth, so many different things, just to make him feel like we will honor you, and your name will be remembered forever, even after you die, we will do that. In another narration, the third thing that they proposed was woman. He started to, he started to you know, basically disrespect the Prophet ﷺ. What was he saying? He said, if you're doing all of this so you can gather some women, you can marry all of them. You know, are these words, is it befitting for these words to be said to a Prophet ﷺ? No. But the Prophet ﷺ was respectful even when he, Utbah, Abu al-Walid, was disrespectful back to the Prophet ﷺ. If you're doing all of this because you want women, Pick whatever woman you want, married or unmarried. Even if she's married, we'll divorce her. You can marry her this instant. He said, no. He's giving up. He's like, okay, this is the fourth thing. It must be this. If you come with this religion because you're insane, because you're a lunatic, because you're a madman, because you're sick, you have an illness, you have a disease, we will gather for you the best of doctors and physicians and healers and curers from all of Arabia, and they will come and treat you all together. And they will not leave until you are healed. Just, just tell us, is that it? We will do it for you from our own expense. He said, no. And when the Prophet ﷺ realized that he's done, he said, Ya Abel Walid. Notice he says, Ya Abel Walid. Even though he disrespected the Prophet, ﷺ, the Prophet did not reply back with disrespect. He didn't even reply back by saying his name, which is okay. 
يا عتبة. He didn't say that. He said يا أبا الوليد. And when you say, when you mention someone's kunya and someone's laqab, someone's nickname or their preferred name, it's a sign of respect to that person. So the Prophet ﷺ, after all of this disrespect, he replies, the first thing, he says, Ya Abu al are you done? He says, yes. He said, then hear from me. The Prophet ﷺ recites verses from the Qur'an, chapter 41, Surah Fussilat, verses 1 through 38. And at the 38th verse, there's a sajda, he prostrates, and he gets up, and he looks at Utbah, a man whose face changed. That confidence that he had walking to the Prophet ﷺ looks like uh, as if it's completely dismantled. And he looks at him and he says, this is what I'm here for. These words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this Qur'an. This was Utbah and his story with the Prophet ﷺ. So when Utbah goes back, you know, imagine the, the noblemen are watching Utbah going, you know, to the Prophet speaking and then walking back and they notice that he's walking back as if he was destroyed or something. So Utbah walks back and they're saying, what happened? He says, take my advice. And Utbah is a very, you know, noble man and he was respected amongst the noblemen. He said, take my advice. Leave this man alone. Leave him alone for what he is speaking and preaching will bring, certainly bring, great events. Leave him alone. Subhanallah. This was his words. And this was the respect that the Prophet ﷺ showed him. And this is the respect that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to show. And he mentions about those who are righteous and how they reply back to these types of people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Furqan, chapter number 25, verse 63. And the servants, the true servants of Al-Rahman, of the all merciful Allah are those when they walk upon the earth they walk humbly they walk easy and when they are addressed harshly by ignorant people they only speak words of peace salama they only speak words of peace and this was the prophet والسلام, and this was the example he taught to the sahaba and to us you know you, you can even see like a man the prophet والسلام, who trash was thrown in front of his house and he never retaliated he retaliated he never did that. He was always merciful to the people who oppressed him, subhanAllah. And because of that, many of them accepted Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about this in the Quran many, many times. He says in Surah Ash-Shu'ar, Ash-Shura, verse number 43 from chapter number 42. A'udhu billahi min rajim And those who are patient and forgive, because you need both of them. You can't forgive without being patient. You need to be patient in order to forgive someone who harmed you, who truly affected your life. You need to be patient. So whoever is patient and forgives, truly that is a matter that takes a great amount of determination. It's not something that is easy. It's not something that you can wake up and do. You have to truly forgive someone and overpass justice and be merciful, subhanAllah. Even though justice is what, you, you, what is okay with you, you're going above and beyond that and being merciful to that servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's another beautiful story of one of the maternal cousins, one of the cousins of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, Mistah. And Mistah was a very poor man, and he was a relative to Abu Bakr. So Abu Bakr used to give money to Mistah. He would support him, and some, some scholars say that he even supported his mother, basically his family. He would support Mistah. He was a family member, and he was a poor man. So Abu Bakr gave him money. And one day, when the rumors were going around in al Medina that Aisha radiallahu anha has committed an evil act of fornication and this rumor was going on and even unfortunately some of the Muslims accepted it and were propagating that rumor Mistah became one of those people who were spreading that rumor Mistah, the cousin of Abu Bakr is speaking ill of Abu Bakr's daughter Aisha the wife of his best friend Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and the wife of his prophet in Islam. So he affected him in three different ways. He affected him in three different ways. Through blood, through friendship, and through religion. Through blood, because it's his own daughter, Aisha. Through friendship, because this his best friend is Muhammad Sallallahu and this is his wife. And through his religion, because this is his honored prophet, and that is his wife, subhanAllah. 
So when he heard this, Abu Bakr said, I am never going to give mislah anything ever again. He does not deserve it, especially after what he said. He doesn't deserve it. And some of the other sahaba, they went on to do this as well to some of their other people that they supported. And what happened? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes down with a verse, with an ayah from the Quran, from Surah An-Nur, chapter 24, verse number 22. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the, in the end of the verse, A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajeem. وَلْيَعْفُوا وَلْيَصْفَحُوا أَلَا تُحِبُّونَ أَن يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَّحِيمٌ وَلْيَعْفُوا وَلْيَصْفَحُوا Let them forget and forget. You know, al-'afu is when you forgive someone from not punishing them. You forgive them. I won't hold you accountable. But a safh is when you go above and beyond that and act as if it never happened. You know when you turn a page of, of, of a book, you can't see what's behind that other page. Because it's, it's like literally it never happened because it's not there in front of you. And that's exactly how you treat that person. You forgive them but you forget. And oftentimes, if we have enough iman to forgive, it's very tough to forget. Brothers, please move forward. Jazakum Allah khair. You know, we might have enough faith to say, you know what, this man wronged me, this person wronged me, but I'll forgive him. It took patience and determination, like I said, but I'll forgive them. But it's hard to forgive and forget. And what does that mean? It means that you never bring it up again as if it never happened. You don't sit there and say, man, I forgive you, but I'm never going to forget. I'm never going to forget this. And the next time he does something like it or he displeases you or something like that, you're going to sit there and be like, man, come on, I just forgave you. you. Remember when you did this and this and this and this? I forgave you. What's up, man? Come, how many more excuses are you going to use? That's not what a safh is. To forgive and overlook and pardon and forget. That is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us here. وَالْيَعْفُوا وَالْيَصْفَحُوا why should we do this? Don't you, wouldn't you want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you? You know, Abu Bakr was just in saying, I'm not going to support mislah because he said evil things about my family. He's just. It's his own money. He doesn't have to give it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us, go above justice and be merciful. Because if you want Allah to be just with you, we wouldn't enter Jannah. Even the Prophet says that without the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he himself would not enter Jannah. So be merciful as many times as you can over justice with others so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can be merciful with you. Wallahu ghafoor rahim and Allah is all forgiven, all merciful. There are many places in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings this up. Surah Al-Ma'idah, chapter 5, verse number 13. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajeem. Fa'fu anhum wasfah inna Allah yuhibbu al-muhsineen and forgive them and pardon, overlook that as if it never happened. Don't bring it up again. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves those who are doing good, who do righteous deeds. Alhamdulillahi wahda wa salatu wa salamu ala man la nabiyya ba'da Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man ihtada bi sunnatihi ila yawm al-deen Along with these verses from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet ﷺ has pushed this idea forward with some of his own sayings in a hadith. Where the Prophet ﷺ says in a hadith, عن جابر بن عبد الله رضي الله عنه قال صلى الله عليه وسلم من لا يرحم الناس لا يرحمه الله and This is in Muslim and in Bukhari it's, the wording is a little different but it's the same meaning لا يرحم الله من لا يرحمه الناس That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not show mercy on those who do not show mercy on the people. You know, show mercy on the creation to receive mercy from the Creator. Have that goal in your mind. In another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ says, الرحمون يرحمهم الرحمن ارحموا من في الأرض يرحمكم من في السماء In a Tirmidhi and in uh, Abu Dawood, the Prophet ﷺ says that those who have mercy with one another, the all-merciful Allah will shower them with mercy. So show mercy to those, the inhabitants of the earth, and you will be shown mercy from above seven heavens, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is one thing that we need to take into our, into our own lives, into our own jobs, into our own schools, with our friends, with our family. And whenever we are confronted with any verbal or physical abuse, especially from non-Muslims and Muslims, of, of course, we need to reply in the prophetic way how the Prophet ﷺ replied back to these.
um, hateful comments and hateful actions. Allahumma gfir al-Muslimin wa al-Muslimat, al-Mu'minin wa al-Mu'minat, al-Hiyaa minhum wa al-Amwat. Inna ka qarib mujib al-Dawat. Allahumma gfir lana dhunubana wa israfana fi amrina wa thabbit aqdamana wa ansurna ala al-Qawm al-Kafirin. Ya muqallib al-Qulub, thabbit qulubana ala dinik. Ya